Okay, so final major con of the US, uh, the way I see it, is the fact that everyone says the United States is a private healthcare system. I feel some level of moral superiority over my fellow man because I work in the NHS, which is then National Health Service, which is a public healthcare system. In America, if you can't afford to have your operation, they're going to chuck you out because you're homeless and you haven't got insurance. I couldn't possibly work in a system that treats its citizens so poorly. You know, I would never want to work in private healthcare. Yeah. How does that work? <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, this is a really valid concern. And okay. I mean, I always want to give the caveat before all of this because um, now that I'm over in America and I'm so enthusiastic about all of this, people think that I'm somehow, you know, like I don't like the system here or I'm very critical of the system here. Mm. But I'll always say the NHS is an incredible uh, system. Public health care, I think, is is morally good and I think it, it's something which is uh, which people should be proud of and I think it, it's something which works fantastically for the population as a whole and I think it really is compassionate in its structure. The only thing I will say is it's not without its um, downsides. I think um, that's something which we often do turn a blind eye to because we love it so much here in England and it deserves the love that we give it but you have to understand that there are definitely trade-offs when you do have a public uh, system versus a private system. So um, in terms of the heartless nature of a private system, that's what I've heard so much about. Mm. People told me that, you know, when I was in England, they said, oh, I heard that people get like, uh, the ambulance comes and they're about to take them, but they just check their insurance card first. And if it's not right, then they'll just drive yeah. away. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, like there's, there's animals. <laughs> like, terrible, yeah. <laughs> so when I went out on my elective, I was like ready for this. I was just looking around like, oh my God, it's going to be really awkward. Like, I wonder if they're going to make me break the news that someone has to leave. Like the medical student, like, you know, go kick that guy out. Yeah. So I was really worried about what I might see. And all I'll say is, it is definitely overblown, that fear of, you know, um, care being withheld from people because uh, they don't have insurance, things like that. They are not ever allowed to withhold any life-saving, life-stabilizing care from anybody, regardless of the ability to pay. So that's complete. I think maybe there were some horror stories like 20, 30 years ago where people knew about things like this, but um, that doesn't exist anymore. So I personally, again, did my year of medicine where um, tons of our patients were homeless patients illegal immigrants, no insurance, who we had, for example, in an ICU bed for like 60 days straight. Oof, and each of those beds okay, yeah, cost, then, you know. But then surely they're going to get a bill for two million and they're going to become bankrupted and live their life in servitude, right? Well, no, <laughs> you think so. Yeah, they're just like working <laughs> yeah, in the cafeteria. Exactly, yeah. um, so they clean the dishes until they're free. No. <laughs> so no, that really doesn't happen. So um, okay. there are a surprising uh, amount of systems whereby these kinds of things, people who have inability to pay medical debt, they can get it wiped and forgiven based on their circumstances um, su- with surprising regularity. And I myself was a skeptic about this. I was like, oh, all right, you guys are just telling me that to make mm. me feel better. But um, I actually benefited from it myself. When I first moved to the US, like about six months in, I came back to the UK uh, to visit uh, my wife Shireen and um, we went to an indoor trampoline park on <laughs> day two of my trip to England. <laughs> Sounded like a good thing to do, yeah. you know, half jet lag, it's fun yeah, to go exactly. bounce around. Yeah, impress the wife. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> So it turns out that although it was really fun for an hour and a half, in the last 10 minutes, I uh, <laughs> there was a portion where I was jumping side to side and then I tried to stop myself immediately. So it's kind of like a half pipe of trampolines. Yeah. Okay. Tried to stop myself immediately, twisted, it just snapped. I just felt it just blow out completely my right knee. Oh my God. And uh, I hit the ground and it was, you know, that ex- when the pain is so extreme that you can't even shout, it was like that level of blinding pain. Okay. So I was just lying there on the ground in the inner trampoline park and I just turned to Shreen and I said, um, can you go get someone for help? I ruptured my ACL. <laughs> and she thought I was joking, so she started laughing. And I was like, um, no, no, really, Shiro, I've, I've ruptured my ACL. Can, can you go get help? So then eventually she realized I was being serious because yeah. I wasn't moving. And then the guy came, the worker came, and he was telling me, he was like, oh, mate, trust me, if you'd ruptured your ACL, you'd know about it. I'm here, like, lying on the ground <laughs> trying to persuade this guy. It, yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm a doctor. I know I have ruptured my ACL. <laughs> like, do you have a stretcher? So they did have a stretcher, but long story short, I eventually I came and got my... Uh, Knee MRI here in England, and I had ruptured my ACL. I was broken yes. a couple of bones and everything. Yeah, I was validated. I was nice. like, yes. Um, I was doing the anterior draw test on myself, oh, and yeah. I was like, no firm endpoint. <laughs> See? Oh, amazing. See, ACL rupture. I've never seen that in real life. <laughs> I know it felt great. Yeah. Um, in one way. Uh, so then, <laughs> so then, um, I had done an elective in the US, right? So I knew in orthopedic surgery, ironically enough, at the Hospital for Special Surgery, which is um, the world's number one orthopedic hospital. So while I was there, I had I made some friends with some of the consultants who I'd worked with. And so I just messaged one of them, like my MRI. And I was like, oh, dude, look what happened. Interestingly enough, he trained in the UK. 
like seven, eight years ago, and he'd won the gold medal for the number one performance in the orthopedic really? um, and like a, exam. And FRCS orthopedic. Yes, yeah, exactly. He was the number one who gold medalist in the country. Yeah. Then he went to America. <laughs> this is a recurring theme here. Yeah. Of course it is. He went to America. So I told him, I was like, this is what's happened. I'm here in England. I'll probably get it done. And his exact words were, um, I've trained in England. Nobody should get their ACL <laughs> repaired in England. <laughs> no shade. This was just his exact words. So he said, come back to America. Like, I'll waive my fee. Don't worry about it. Come back and I'll sort it out for you. So I was like, oh, sweet. Like, I know this guy. Like, he'll be able to waive his fee. When I came back, I realized there's like a hospital fee and a consultant fee. So I was still going to be liable for paying quite a big, you know, hospital fee is what I thought. So the bill for my surgery was going to be coming to around about like, you know, one and a half or two thousand dollars. And I was thinking, oh, is that it? It, it, oh. It, it's less than that because I have insurance, right? So, like, oh, you have insurance. Okay. If you have insurance right. and legally everyone in the country is supposed to have insurance. Like, yeah. you have to legally have insurance. Yeah. Um, so I had insurance, but it was still coming to $2,000 and I was a bit like, I'm only earning like 50K as yeah. a researcher, blah, blah. But then he told me, oh, there's a, a financial assistance program as part of the hospital. Like go onto the online website, fill in your details and see what they can do for you. So like, okay, it's worth a try. I mean, 50K is not nothing. Like, you know, it's, it's a reasonable yeah, okay, amount of money. Yeah. So I filled it in and then I got a letter um, within literally about like five, six days, like an email uh, sent to me. And I'll put a screenshot of it actually up here now uh, for people to reflect on. As you can see, when you read this, it says that uh, we've reviewed your application and we've shown that you are uh, eligible for 100% uh, coverage of all of your hospital fees for the next two years. So even someone who's earning $50,000, yeah. the hospital had a system whereby they wiped all of my fees, including all of my re uh, physical therapy fees, everything, because I was earning only $50,000. Oh, amazing. For so, the next two years. For the next two years. You're like back of the trampoline park. <laughs> uh, so I kept bouncing everywhere. I just okay, the shoulder. I thought I may as well get repaired. Well, yeah. So yeah, I mean, listen, I'm not saying that you don't get horror stories. I'm not saying that everyone has all their medical fees wiped. I just think it's interesting that we have no knowledge of this kind of like more um, kind of compassionate side of the healthcare system there where even somebody who's earning $50,000 unemployed has all of their hospital fees waived for them. And any patient, when I was, as an inpatient doctor, we never once discussed Anything we're giving the patient and saying, oh, actually, no, we can't get that imaging because they don't have insurance. I, I'm not trying to, you know, I have no horse in this race. Mm. I would call it out if I had seen it. It never happened. The only time I felt the impact of uh, making decisions on people's insurances is sometimes, for example, we wanted to, like, uh, discharge someone on, say, um, Eloquist, which is a Pixaban. Yeah. We wanted to discharge someone on a Pixaban, but um, their insurance actually only covered inoxaparin oh. for their, you know, uh, yeah. DVT prophylaxis, things like that, or for the uh, atrial fibrillation. So, um there were small things where, you know, okay, maybe you really love Pixaban, but yeah. like it wasn't the end of the world. It was like yeah. you give one formation or another, or yeah. say you're discharging someone with insulin, their insurance might not cover the auto-injector insulin, and they would have to be uh, prescribed the vial instead. Okay. So, yeah, it's inconvenient, and given the choice, I'd rather give everyone the auto-injector, but um, I didn't see things where it was like, okay, oh, so we need to give this guy, you know, a week of ciprofloxacin, but he can't afford it, so uh, good luck, <laughs> and try Epsom salts. <laughs> so, yeah, that, you know, that never happened. So I just think... Um, that's the kind of thing which people uh, should get an experience of themselves. So I think um, as much as I say this, it's only really going to resonate when you come out and you um, visit on your clinical elective where you get an experience of even an observership and you will see for yourself, is this as heartless as I worried about? Or, you know, is it actually on the whole seem like pretty good, compassionate care full of good people? And uh, that, that was my takeaway message from it, at least. So um, that's what I'll say about the private public thing. And then the one other thing <laughs> I will say is that... Um, I find it strange sometimes when people in the UK are like, I could never go over there because those poor Americans, you know, they don't have public health care. And I'm wondering, like, what is gained by you not going there? <laughs> like, how, how does that help those poor Americans, for example? And also, those poor Americans have a say in what type of healthcare system they do have. So I'm very engaged in, in politics on the whole. And I know that, for example, we have an election in 2020 that's happening uh, in America. And most of the democratic frontrunners are talking about the type of healthcare system that they want to uh, build in the US. Now, there's people like Bernie Sanders who are talking about making a public healthcare system. Like it's called Medicare for All, but basically it'll be very similar to the NHS in terms of there being a government run healthcare system. Mm. Um, it's not very popular <laughs> amongst, amongst the population. Um, people are saying they don't want socialized healthcare because. They hear scare stories about the wait times that people have to go through here in England and delays in procedures and the emergency rooms overflowing and all those kind of things. Which is all true. <laughs> Which yeah. You, yeah, you, you can't deny yeah. it. But, but um, it's just funny because the people over there are like, socialized healthcare, oh my goodness, no, yeah. oh, those poor we're people. like, private healthcare, oh God, that's terrible. Exactly. Yeah. So I just find it so funny that I'd love to like put two people in a room together and be like, 
discuss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see that, like, you know, you can argue philosophically what you think or even practically what you think is a better healthcare system. But just know that they aren't, you know, poor, powerless people in there who have been forced to live on this private healthcare system. Mm. Americans believe in the free market in such an inherent way that for them, they are convinced that they have the best. They think they have access to the best medications. They think they have cutting edge treatments faster than other parts of the, of the world, which is true. And uh, they also think that they have shorter wait times. Also true. Now, alongside that, they're spending 20% of their GDP on healthcare, which isn't great for your, for your economy as a whole. And people are having to pay for um, different parts of their, health, uh, of their healthcare. But that's the healthcare system which they have genuinely chosen and believe in. Okay. So I don't think you should feel bad for them and think, oh, I couldn't go there because those poor people, like, they think the same about people here in England. And, you know, you would find that funny if someone told you that, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so I suppose, uh, I suppose the... The main objection I've heard, I've heard to this tends to be on moral grounds that, yeah. you know, morally, I would feel more comfortable working in public health care. And, yeah. and I suppose what we're saying is, all right, fair enough. You know, yeah, this is this is not you or I trying to convince anyone to go to of America. Of course not. No, no, no. Yeah. This is partly me trying to just kind of hash out for myself whether I should. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we, we just have to be filming it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. and I mean, all I'll say is, again, yeah. that that idea of like, you know, morally, I don't think I could. I think it's because you imagine that in your day to day life as a clinician, you are going to need to be compromising your level of care or adjusting your treatment plans. Yeah into suboptimal ways because of people's finances. And if that was happening to me on a day-to-day -day basis, it would really take its toll on me, mm. I'm sure. But all I can say is, I'm not, I'm not lying about it, I'm not trying to front up for any reason, um, I just haven't seen it. In my outpatient uh, clinics now, um, I'm, you know, in dermatology, there are certain cutting edge uh, biologic therapies for psoriasis, which for example, people won't be eligible for um, straight away, right off the bat. But you don't do that here in England. No, okay? here you have to like try two things or like try a third thing exactly. and then you're available for a biologic or something. Here then, in England, yeah. you take your topicals, you yeah. take your toxic methotrexate yeah. for a couple of you know months and yeah. then after you've met these thresholds, you then may be eligible to take that. Yeah. Uh, in America, it, it's similar for some people but based on their insurances, but for other people based on their insurances, they go straight to the absolute cutting edge biologic which will cure their psoriasis in two months. Here in England, you can't get that, right? So, so it is true that there is a lag time between cutting edge... Uh, treatments being available in America and us being able to prescribe them in England. It's about one or two years at times, which can be significant. So um, again, the trade-offs, right? Public versus private. There are definitely trade-offs that you have to appreciate. Um, but anyone who feels like they're morally could not possibly work in, in a private system like that, I encourage them to just take a look at it frontline and see whether or not it does mm -hmm. have that burden on their conscience, uh, whether they see things that I haven't, because there very well could be terrible experiences out there that I haven't seen. Um, so I just encourage everyone, just try it, see what it looks like for yourself, and then uh, make the decision at that point. And if it's unconscionable for you at that point, then absolutely don't do it. You'd be miserable yeah, doing yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's all good.